What's up, vinyl community? Bob Ham here with another video. Uh, skipping away from the recent vinyl acquisitions train, uh, following the lead of a commenter who wanted to see some more genre based videos, and I think uh, they had a really good suggestion about doing. Uh, some stuff about my jazz collection a little bit and I thought I'd keep it simple and grab five records That uh, I feel are very underrated jazz records that I own uh, Again keeping it narrow to what I own and try to pick five records without really dwelling on it too much and What I realized as I was getting ready to make this video is that strangely uh, The majority of the musicians that I'm talking about today and the records I'm talking about today are led by piano players I don't know how that happened, but uh, yeah, that's what's up. So it's probably going to be a short video. Hope you don't mind. Um, thank you for tuning in. Thank you for subscribing. Those are the folks who subscribe. Thank you for your comments. Please feel free to give more. If you have any other like requests, if you will, or suggestions, ideas of future videos. Otherwise, I'll just keep going down the train of stuff that I pick up. Uh, I'm going to do one of those next week. Actually, next week, what I think I'm going to do is some recommendations for uh, the next uh, Record Store Day Black Friday that's coming up on the 25th because I've gotten a lot of interesting promos and some really cool stuff so I could recommend some stuff for you to add to your list or to pick up when you're out shopping next Friday which I imagine a good number of you will be and but then I'll just keep going on the vinyl acquisition train uh, as well gotten some really cool stuff over the past couple weeks as I'm always out there digging out there looking that stuff coming in the mail to me it's pretty great so let's do this. Uh, these are in no particular order, not like ranking these or anything like that. This is just like five records that if you don't own them as a jazz collector, jazz listener, I highly recommend them. And I think they're ones that are kind of, some of them are kind of easy to find. I see them pretty frequently out there used. Um, See, so yeah, I can get them pretty inexpensively as well, I think. These aren't like super rare records. Um, and I think because of that fact, I think people overlook some pretty popular records. Like you can find... Keith Jarrett and Pat Metheny stuff, a lot of ECM stuff, like everywhere at used record stores. But I think it's a great thing because I love ECM's uh, discography and will pick those up whenever I run across them. So, uh, you know, don't, you know, as I'm sure a lot of collectors and a lot of music listeners know, like, you know, popularity does not necessarily mean a lack of quality. So starting off again, this is, just want to reiterate this, not in any uh, ranking or anything like that or no order, just grabbing them off the, the desk next to me here. Starting with uh, McCoy Tyner's Songs of the New World. Uh, McCoy Tyner, famously part of uh, one of John Coltrane's best backing bands, recorded My Favorite Things and A Love Supreme with. And he has made some pretty amazing records as a band leader, as a songwriter. Um, and this is my favorite. This is one that I ran across, uh, luckily a sealed copy of this one, Humble Brag. Uh, this is released in 1973 on Milestone Records. Um, this it's just it's a huge band that he's got for a lot of the songs in here. Um, it's almost like an orchestra, you know. It's a euphonium player. There's three French horn players. Uh, Hubert Law is playing flute. Sonny Fortune playing flute, and a lot of other woodwinds. Tuba, uh, grip of trumpeters, trombonist, two trombonists, including Dick Griffin. Um, and I think, and then on the a uh, couple of the other tracks on here. There's a string section, driven mostly by a string section. I think that sort of lends the, the neoclassical sort of magisterial quality to this record. It feels as big as the earth that's on the cover here. I think he was, uh, I haven't read too much about this record. I think he was aiming for that, sort of aiming for this big, bold statement uh, for his own record. And I think he achieved it in a huge way. Uh, fantastic record. Uh, can't recommend this one enough. Uh, yeah, it's, I mean... Yeah, it kind of reminds me of Coltrane's like a Love Supreme, where like the, the 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 songs are expanded and much bigger, solos go on for longer, and it just feels, you know, enormous when you listen to it. Uh, sort of contrast to that, I think, is this record by Youssef Latif, Eastern Sounds, which uh, I think was released in '61 or '62. Uh, it's just the only record led by a uh, horn player that I've got to talk about. Um, this is one that I found on a whim at a thrift store, just knowing Yousef's work a little bit and want to take a chance on it, you know, it's prestige, you know, can't go really go wrong there. Um, it's a fantastic, beautiful, um, 
understated record is how I, how I keep listening to this stuff. It feels very, very uh, withdrawn. Not withdrawn. Withdrawn might be the right word for it, but it feels restrained. Um, he's playing a lot of uh, unusual wind instruments. Because he's listed here playing tenor sax, oboe, and flute, but there's a, a wind instrument that he plays on the Plum Blossom, the first song in here, that's like a gourd, I think, with finger holes on it and a blowhole, and, and, and um, it sounds incredible. It's uh, Yeah, it's a really austere, beautiful record, and, and he's uh, met every step of the way by his backing band, which is Barry Harris on piano, Ernie Farrell playing bass, and Lex Humphreys on drums. Yeah, uh, and... I'm, you know, the love thing from Spartacus I'm not a huge fan of, but I think he makes records one of the best versions of that on here. Uh, yeah, really incredible record. Really incredible record. So this one uh, next is another piano player, Roland Hanna. Uh, a live album called Perugia. It was recorded at the Montreux Festival in 74. Uh, this is a reissue that Org Music did for, I think, a record store day release or something around there. Uh, originally released, let's see, so this reissue was done in 2018, I think this was originally released in 74, 75, somewhere in there. Um, I am a big sucker for this Freedom label, which is an offshoot of Arista Records. Um, they released a lot of interesting stuff over the years in the 70s, uh, some stuff by uh, Cecil Taylor, some stuff by, I think, the New York Rock and Roll Ensemble. Um, can't remember some of the other titles, but, uh, you know, look them up. If you see this sort of, uh, and they're, uh, I think it was, uh, what was I thinking of his name? He's a guitar player. Anyway, I just had one come to my head, but I'm not going to go on down. This is the uniform packaging, so you can kind of see these around and you know what you're getting into. And, uh, something that I came when I was doing a show at a radio station, public radio station in Astoria, Oregon, uh, I would see these on the in the jazz shelves and started you know falling in love with everything that I heard on this on this imprint freedom. Uh, but this is another um, just a joyful record is what it feels like to me. I think this this beatific uh, face that Roland Hanna is making on this uh, illustration on the cover is very much uh, in line with the sound of this. I mean he's doing like you know Duke Ellington songs, some of his uh, his originals, and the Thad Jones song of Child Is Born. Um, but yeah, just he's is just so in love with the music, so in love with playing, uh, especially playing for people, and sort of uh, generated that energy in a room and trying to connect with people as he did so well when he was playing live. Um, yeah, really, really fantastic record. I love listening to this one uh, in the evenings when I'm making dinner. Um, and this this new master is actually really, really nice. I, I had an original. I don't know if I. Might have uh, traded it off once I got this this reissue, but uh, yeah, the originals are pretty easy to come across. A lot of a lot of the the uh, Freedom label stuff is really easy to get hold of. Maybe not the Cecil Taylor one, but a lot of the other folks that they worked with. Jan Garbrek is who I was thinking of, by the way. Just came to my head. Um, this is another artist that you, if you're a jazz listener, you know, you either love or hate. I think I don't know if there's a lot of middle ground. Like you maybe like Take Five, the Time Out with Take Five on it. And Blue Rondo All the Turk, but you know, he, the Dave Brubeck and the Dave Brubeck Quartet released so many records in the 50s and 60s that, you know, their record stores, used record stores are clouded with these things. Um, unnecessarily, I think. I think he is, a f I don't want to say, he's not overlooked. I think he's underappreciated. I think people respect what he was trying to do with time signatures and working with, uh, you know, modes of African music and, and Eastern uh, rhythms and melodies, but uh, I think he just kind of gets overlooked by a lot of folks because, you know, he's just a jazz piano player that was kind of ubiquitous for a number of years. And, like, again, a lot of these records, you just see these as you're running, as you're digging through used jazz records, you're just like, yeah, it's like a Dave Brubeck section that's like that thick with like 40 records in there. And it can be hard to kind of pick and choose if you don't know anything beyond time out um and i think this is a great place to go if you already have time out uh countdown time in outer space is, is the way to go and i i don't know i i wonder if this was this is again something i probably should have looked into before i talked on camera but this is something that i wonder if the record company like columbia kind of forced this is like well we gotta add like a time thing to it so people will know kind of connect it to the record that made you famous and and then we can you know hopefully sell some more copies of it uh, I don't know if that's the case or not, but uh, I would imagine so. Uh, but this does, like, 
follow that same thread of screwing with uh, time signatures, the usual time signatures of, of jazz music. There's a song here called 11-4, which tells you everything you need to know about what they're going for. But there's, uh, you know, I, I love Brubeck's stuff, and I think this is, you know, has that great, you know, joyful swing to it. There's some really harder edge stuff on here, like not crazy free jazz. Like I don't think Dave Brubeck could ever, would ever have gone down that lane. Uh, but there's some pretty hard edge stuff in here, like Countdown has a real, like, sort of grind, like, grinding pop bop feel to it. And there's a great version of Someday Mail Prince Will Come on here, which is, you know, a song that is probably burned into the psyche of every American born after 1955. But uh, it's still an incredible piece of work uh, that he does, has so much fun with that song. Uh, I'd also recommend if you're checking this one on the stream, there's a song called Waltz Limp. That kind of uh, has that sort of hiccuping quality into the waltz rhythm that I think you'll really appreciate. As it says here, uh, waltz limp is danced by the heroine who has lost her shoe. So kind of a Cinderella thing he's talking about here. Really fantastic record. Uh, the last one I want to talk about, uh, this is one that I've uh, dug into quite a bit. I've written a story about this guy, Herman Zobel. Um, a strange, strange character. Uh, I believe he was... So this is where I say I've, I've written about him, but I believe he's an Austrian guy. Um, very young musician, very virtuosic piano player, this kid. And if the story that I know is correct, there's this, this, this sort of legendary story of this guy, that he sort of walked into a studio where uh, Roberta Flack was working on some music and declared himself the greatest piano player to ever walk the face of the earth. And everyone was like, okay, kid, like show us what you got. He sat down and kind of blew some people away and ended up making this record for Arista Records. And um, got pretty well known in New York and playing around the East Coast a little bit, playing some shows, but I think his ego got the better of him and he started really uh, demanding more of people and demanding more of the record companies and they were getting a little frustrated with him, but he was gearing up uh, to make a second record you know, doing some shows, and I think studio time is booked, and then he just disappeared off the face of the earth. I think people have spotted him somewhere overseas. There's some pictures of him, like a like a, a passport photo of him, looking really scraggly and bedraggled somewhere in uh, East Asia. Um, but beyond that, he's kind of vanished. And yeah, a really interesting story. There's a, a story I wrote about him on uh, this website, Consequence. You can look for that. Uh, it's H-E-R-M-A-N-N-S-Z-O-B-E-L if you want to search for that. But this is a really, really crazy record. Uh, crazy, almost Zappa-like jazz stuff. I'm not a huge Zappa fan, but there's something about this that really connects with me. Very angular, almost proggy in a lot of the construction of these songs and the way that he plays. <clears throat> He's also playing, like, you talked about Brubeck playing with a bit of a harder edge to it, and this guy is just all hard edges. Just angular, you can cut yourself on the, on some of the stuff he's playing on here. Yeah, really, really interesting record. Um, played with a lot of interesting people. Bob Goldman, uh, David Samuels playing Vibes and Marimba, Michael Viscalia on electric bass. Um, I spoke with, uh, you know, I don't remember specifically which one of the guys I spoke to for this record. I think it was Bob Goldman, but talked about working with him and just what a, what a strange mind that he had that created this very mathematical sounding jazz stuff that would have been, I think, really beloved by um, the ECM world. I think if he had continued going down that path, he probably would have ended up on ECM or on uh, one of the like ESP or something like that, one of the more avant labels out there. Uh, it's one of those really sad stories that you kind of wish that he could have continued to see where he would have gone with this, whether he would have gone further down that, you know, explosive fractalized sound, or whether he would have smoothed things out and try to be more commercial, which I know does happen with some musicians like that. But uh, yeah, a record. This is one, I don't know if this one is as easy to get a hold of. I feel like it is. Um, it has been reissued on CD by a label, I think, out of New Jersey. Another guy who fell in love with this record and, and really wanted to honor it. Um, yeah, it, it's just a funny story. Like, I, I was kind of... Someone he was connected with that I was trying to get for an interview for the story uh, refused my interview because as they as someone who was uh, in a relationship with Herman at some point in his, in his life, uh, I think post his disappearance, 
someone who I think had been written about a little bit before, so I, I read about her and was like, you know, I really want to talk to you about this. And she said, no, I'm thinking of writing a book about my experience. So I was like, oh, that's too bad, because this was a guy I think would make an interesting book, you know, just the disappearing jazz artist. I think this is, you know, a few folks like that out there in the world who just kind of musicians that made some amazing work and then just vanished. And um, Milford Graves, is Milford Graves who I'm thinking of? No, this is a saxophone player, I think, kind of a bass player. It's a bass player who I can't think of the name of right now who kind of uh, made some great records for ESP and, and, and vanished and was found homeless at some point and kind of uh, raised out of the mire to start making music again later in his life and has done some pretty amazing stuff. I'm sure you know who I'm talking about, jazz fans, so apologize my brain's not working as quickly as I want for this video, but <laughs> that's, that's the way it goes sometimes. Uh, yeah, Herman Zobel. I hope you look into that. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you enjoyed this video. Uh, again, I'll be back again uh, next week with my picks for Record Store Day Black Friday. Uh, be sure to check out Paste, where I do my uh, record time column covering vinyl releases. If you're in the Portland area, I sell stuff at Memory Den and Crossroads, and I also do stuff on Discogs. You can find me under the username The Ice Maiden, or follow me on Instagram at Picnic Lightning Records. Thanks very much. We'll see you next time, folks.